a huge number of new homes that are currently being built at the moment in Wantage and Grove and the surrounding area. And I'm sure that many of you will have noticed that you can't uh, fail to, uh, to, to notice the amount of building work that there is at the moment in this area. Um, Wellington Gates, the, uh, the old airfield at Grove, uh, Letcombe Gardens, uh, that's a Grove as well by the, uh, the Williams Formula One site, uh, Childry Park and Kings Grove um, uh, at Shallow, uh, Eastgate in Wantage uh, at the old King Alfred School site. Huge amount of building work. And these uh, new houses, these new homes, are bringing more people into the area to live and to work, bringing more opportunity for the local church here and wantage to share the good news with those people as they come into the area. But Jesus Christ is very much in the construction, in the building business. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus makes this promise. He says, I will build my church. There's no hesitancy or uncertainty about this. This building work is going to go ahead. It's going to be finished. I will build my church. And Jesus uh, commissions us, his followers, his disciples, those who, would, who follow in his footsteps, to be part of this building project. We were, we've already mentioned the Great Commission already in Matthew chapter 28, so that, that wonderful mission statement from Jesus where he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And this uh, building mission statement sets a, very much a, a global direction and purpose for the Church of Jesus Christ. It's a bold, dynamic and challenging mission a command for the followers of Jesus. So it's, this is not something to be ignored. This is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing the new believers in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I'm sure many of you will have had the experience of uh, throwing a, a stone or a pebble into a lake or a pond, um, and the impact of that stone just causes ripples to sort of move out and spread out across the water surface. And this is a good analogy, I believe, for that extraordinary growth and, and the building that we, that we see and we read about in the early church. Following the impact of the life, of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Christian good news would just spread out around the planet uh, in ever-increasing circles. It's almost like a, a, a tidal wave that would sweep around the planet, uh, reaching all the peoples. A church that spread the gospel, a message of good news and hope. A, a church that grew by thousands of people each day. Phenomenal growth. A church that couldn't be held back by opposition or persecution. A church that would turn the world upside down. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we read this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The church could not be grown and built by its own efforts, by its own energy. The church needed God's assistance and input into this. The church needed the Holy Spirit in their lives, the power of God fueling this building. And it was then that they would be ready to share the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. Now initially these disciples, they were closeted away behind closed doors, and they were fearful, they were full of doubt, and personal shame, many of them had denied Jesus Christ and let him down. But it was these same people who would then be miraculously transformed by God. God's powerful Holy Spirit would work in them and through their lives. And we read in the Bible of bold and powerful preaching, healing of the sick, uh, loving Christianity, the good news of Jesus Christ being boldly shared throughout the world, reaching the shores of mainland Europe, reaching here, the UK, turning the world upside down. A message of good news and hope for all people. And that includes us. 
And we all need, also need to play a part in building the church of Jesus Christ. But what exactly are we building? What is church about? Well, to help us to answer this question, we're going to be looking at uh, the, the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, uh, the 66th book. Um, if you, for those of you who know your Bible, read through your Bible. It's got 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. And this is the final of those 66 books. And we're going to be looking at one of those uh, seven different churches that we read about in the book of Revelation. So seven churches, they're listed on the slide here for you. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I'd like us this morning just to draw some lessons from uh, one of these churches to understand maybe things that we need to learn as individuals and maybe as a church here in Wantage. And the book of Revelation was written by the Apostle Paul and he also, uh, sorry, the Apostle John, uh, and he also um, wrote the Gospel of John and also three letters, um, uh, obviously one John, two John, three John. Um, uh, so so the, the Apostle John wrote a number of books that we read um, I- about in the New Testament. But this is a rather unique book at the end of the Bible. The word Revelation in the Greek is apocalypsis. This is the book of the apocalypse. And much of this book in, of Revelation is quite difficult to understand uh, and, and to interpret. It is full of visions and symbolism, and it describes the end of the world and the return of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle John describes how um, God one day gave him a vision. So it was a Sunday, it was the Lord's Day, and he was on the island of Patmos. And he describes in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, Uh, that he was in the spirit, that's how the Bible describes it, and he has this vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, who who instructs him to write this. Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. What you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. What you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. Very much a past, present, and future what you have seen, this opening vision of the Lord Jesus Christ that was given to him. The present, what is now, the situation that the seven churches in Asia were finding themselves in. And then the future, what will take place later? The end days, the end of the world. And it's in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 that I'd like us to focus this morning as we focus on the what is now. As the Apostle John writes these seven letters to the seven churches Um, in Asia, in modern-day Turkey. There were other churches in Asia, by the way, um, but just seven were chosen to receive these specific uh, letters. Letters, messages, to be passed on to them, a message from Jesus Christ. Each of these churches had their own strengths and weaknesses, um, the good things about them, the bad things about them, but a distinct and unique letter, a unique message is given to each church. So this morning I'd like us to look at the first of those churches, Um, we don't have time to go any further than that, as we look at the church in Ephesus. And we're going to be looking at the passage uh, that Debbie read to us a little bit earlier on from Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through to 7, that is the letter to the church in Ephesus. And I'd like us just to be thinking about this question that we, we raised at the beginning, what is church about? And what are we building as a church? What are we trying to do here? The city of Ephesus was an ancient Greek city. Um, It was located in uh, the western coast of uh, Asia. As I say, it's in modern-day Turkey. Um, In Roman times, this was the largest city in Asia. Um, It's very much a centre for Roman administration. Um, It's a flourishing commercial um, and export centre, a breathtaking city. And it had a prominent religious centre. And this city was famous for the temple of Artemis, or in Latin, Diana. So this was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, this temple. And people came from right around the Mediterranean 
uh, to worship in the temple of this goddess, Diana. And even today, if you, um, go to, you can go to Ephesus and see the ruins. Um, it's a, a favourite international tourist attraction in uh, non-COVID times when we can travel. Um, but you can very much go around the ruins and see uh, this wonderful city, what remains of it, even today. And the Apostle Paul, he originally founded the church in Ephesus, um, and it became very much a large and important church in Asia, uh, very much a centre, a Christian centre for evangelising out to the rest of Asia. And the letter to the church in, uh, in Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2, begins by making it clear that this letter was not from, the, from, from John, but actually this was from Jesus Christ himself. Okay, this, this was from God himself. Verse 1. These are the words of him, that's Jesus Christ, who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So as I mentioned, lots of imagery and pictures here in, in this book. And in the previous verse, in uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, we're told that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So these lampstands that have been mentioned about here are the seven churches who are to be lights in that part of the world, shining out into the dark world around them. And the church in Ephesus is commanded by uh, Jesus for for many things. Verse 2, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. And in verse 3, you have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So much for this church to be commended for, the things that they were doing, for their hard work and perseverance, for not tolerating wickedness, for testing Uh, those claiming to be apostles, but who weren't really, they were false teachers. This church had persevered, they'd endured hardship, they had not grown weary. And in verse uh, 6, we don't have this on the the slides, but they were also commended for hating the practices of the Nicolaitans. And this was a a, a sect that uh, taught Christian liberty, uh, compromising with the pagan world around them, Uh, promoting idolatry and sexual immorality, things that should not be in the church. Superficially, the Ephesian church, they appeared to be a great church. They'd really got their act together. They were really doing the right things, hard-working and persistent, avoiding false teaching and wickedness, theologically sound and diligent. But then comes the sting in the tail. In verses 4 and 5, when Jesus says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. There was a huge spiritual problem for the church in Ephesus. They were doing all the right things. They were regularly holding services for worship and prayer. They were holding outreach events. Uh, They were holding other church meetings and activities. But they had lost sight that Christianity is primarily about a love relationship with God. That's what it's about. Their work was motivated not by love, but by duty and routine. And they needed to rediscover their first love, their love and their passion for God. They needed to rediscover also their love for each other. Change and revival were required in this church. And the Ephesian church are instructed to repent of their old ways, to go back to basics, if you like, in their Christian lives, to to rediscover their love for the Lord to fall in love with God all over again and to learn to love each other, to put God first in their lives, living Christian lives that were were fueled by the love of God. And Jesus then gives the church 
in Ephesus a very stern, a severe warning in verse 6. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. This was not a trivial matter. If they, they did not repent and change their ways, the church in Ephesus, the lampstand that we read about here, would be dismantled and removed. The light in Ephesus would go out. But Jesus then finishes with a, the letter with very much a, a message of hope and encouragement for the church here. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the, what the Spirit says to the churches. And for us as a church, and maybe as individuals as well, for those of us who have ears to hear, we are to listen and seriously take on board this letter to the Ephesian church. For Christian believers who listen to this message, who change their ways, who love God and live their lives uh, in love and service to God, for these Christian believers, we're told that they will eat from the tree of life. They will have eternal life and also a future life in that paradise of God, eternal life with God in heaven. So what is church about? It's very easy for us to fall into this trap of cold, uh, routine, mechanical religion. Maybe having busy lives filled with church activities and meetings. Maybe a challenge for us as we look to get going again as a church um, in, uh, following the, uh, the COVID restrictions. What will this church look like? here at Wantage Baptist Church. We need to be careful that we're not just pursuing theological knowledge and understanding or maybe just working hard with perseverance in the church, but maybe neglecting our hearts, maybe neglecting to nurture our love relationship with God. Jesus was once asked what the greatest commandment was. And he replied in Matthew chapter 22, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. If you want to know what God wants from you in your life, then it's this. If you want to know what the church is all about, then it's this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. In building the church, the church is built on a strong foundation of Christian love. That foundation has to be there first before we can build the church. Loving God and putting him first in all we do. And secondly, learning to love each other. And the Bible couldn't be any clearer here. I think this is actually quite difficult teaching. But Jesus never said that being a Christian was going to be easy, did he? This is teaching that we all need to take on board, and I include myself in this. It's easy to love the people who maybe we like, but it's much harder to, to love the people maybe we find difficult or we don't understand or are different in some way to us. But we need to love God and we need to love each other. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. Well, may each one of us learn to love more, to love God more, to love each other more, 
may we rediscover and refresh our love for God, experiencing the joy and the wonder of having that love-filled relationship with him, serving God in the church, but through love-motivated lives that want to serve him, expressing our love and gratitude to him as we serve him. Learning to love each other as God has loved us. Or may we learn from the Ephesian church. May we not make the same mistake that they did. And may this church here in Wantage continue to be built and to grow on a foundation of Christian love.